Hello, good morning. Uh, thanks for having me here. I will talk about the central bank's view, concretely the Swiss national bank's view about uh, digital currencies. Now, you may be familiar with the saying, in God we trust, all others pay cash. That has been a, a common saying for quite some while. So you sometimes see that in a store. Economists have, that, have turned that a little bit around. They have said, distrust is the root of all money. Now, why, why is that? Let me quickly explain. If I buy something from you, I can either say, I pay you tomorrow, I, or I pay you next week, so I can uh, buy something on credit. And that requires that you trust me. You will have a counterparty risk. I'm your risk. The risk is that I will not pay you tomorrow or next week. It's basically the same if I pay with a credit card or if I pay with a debit card, uh, with any kind of a, a bank transfer. If I pay with a debit card, but that basically means that the claim that I have on the bank, my account, I transfer that to you so that you will have a claim on the bank, but then you have still a counterparty risk, namely the bank where your account is could go bankrupt. So you're not getting rid of that risk. And money, this thing, if I pay you with this, you don't need to have a counterparty risk. That's something that doesn't have a counterparty risk. It's the thing itself. There are other issues with trust involved here, but basically if I pay you that, it doesn't matter to you how creditworthy I am. It doesn't matter to you how creditworthy my bank or your bank is. You have the thing in itself. And that's why economists say, that money is basically a substitute for trust. You don't need to trust a counterparty. Now, if you look at the world as we have it today, the, the banknotes, that's basically the only monetary asset, the only traditional monetary asset that you can acquire that doesn't contain a counterparty risk. Central banks also have deposits, which per definition also have no counterparty risk because central banks produce that money. They cannot go bankrupt. They can always produce uh, that type of money, but you cannot have a, an account with your central bank. Only commercial banks can have accounts with central banks. And then the commercial banks gives you an account, and that's where, again, your counterparty, your credit risk comes in with the money. Now, the latest uh, development, of course, are cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin, for instance, that's also the thing in itself. When you get a Bitcoin, there is also no counterparty risk involved, uh, like also with gold, for instance. But the problem there is that, uh, at least at this stage, it's not very, uh, very widely accepted. I mean, you can pay with Bitcoin in a lot of places, but it's clearly not, not everywhere. The same also with gold. And the other problem is, of course, that you have these price uh, fluctuations. Now, if you just want to save in Bitcoins, then it doesn't really matter that much to you. Like, it doesn't really matter to you that equity share prices change from day to day or bond prices change from day to day. But if you want to make a payment with it, then it matters. Now, the solution that a lot of cryptocurrencies came up with is that they create stable coins. But stable coins basically introduce, again, this counterparty risk because a stable coin basically promises you that you can, uh, that you can redeem that stable coin for central bank money again, either for commercial bank money or for central bank money. It's basically the same thing that the commercial banks do. So bank deposits, in a way, are also stable coins because you can always go to your bank and get the real thing, uh, this here. So in that sense, it, it replicates what we have in the traditional, uh, in the traditional sector. So the, what now happens is that a lot of central banks start to talk about whether they should not give access to households, to, to retail customers, uh, to electronic versions of central bank held. And that is either in form of deposits or in some kind of a cryptocurrency token form. Now, the, cent the Bank for International Settlement, which is basically the bank of the central banks, has made now three years in a row a survey among central banks asking them, uh, are you working on CBDC, central bank digital currencies? And you see that uh, I think about 66 central banks have uh, responded, and you see that uh, a large number among them say, yes, we are working on it, it's 80%. And you also see that it has been steadily increasing over the last three years. If you ask them, what are you working on, then uh, about 12%, uh, 15% or so say wholesale central bank digital currencies, which means these are only available to bank, just nowadays the bank deposits, not to retail customers' households. And you see that about 13% say we are working on general purpose central bank digital currencies, which would be available to, to uh, everyone. And then uh, a larger number says both. Now, uh, some say, well, clearly they work on that because 
the, the, this thing here is disappearing. But if you look actually at the statistics, it's not that true. The, uh, very often Sweden is named as an example, and if you look at Sweden here, SE uh, in the lower left uh, square, for them it's really the, really the case. You have on the horizontal cash use for payments, on the vertical cash use for store of value, and you see that Sweden is the only country where cash use for both purposes is declining. But for all other countries, at least use for store of value, it's actually increasing, it's not decreasing. If you look at uh, use of payments, then you have a mix, but you still have a large amount of countries where use of, of cash here, banknotes, is still increasing for both purposes. Switzerland is an obvious example. You see that basically on the, on the line there that both use for store of value and use for payments is still increasing. Uh, Great Britain uh, is basically just in the center uh, where nothing is happening. It's not decreasing, it's not increasing. But so Sweden is really a special case. If you ask central banks, why are you then working on uh, CBDCs, then you hear uh, a lot of times payments efficiency. And I think one thing that we, we learned from Bitcoin, uh, uh, other cryptocurrencies and fintechs is that the payment system has been very inefficient, especially the cross-border payment system. So there needs to be something done about it. We can send an email messages within seconds to the, uh, from here to the United States, but if you want to make a payment from here to the United States through the uh, commercial banks, it takes several days and there is clearly uh, no need for that. And that's one of the reasons why central banks have been starting to work on that. Uh, you hear arguments like payment robustness, financial stability. For a lot of emerging markets, also financial inclusion is very important. They say a lot of people do not have bank accounts, but they have smartphones. So you can actually include them into the financial uh, system. Now, what is the likelihood that central banks are going to issue uh, central bank digital currencies. And here I have to say a lot of times you have a lot of messages, central bank such and such has already issued it. Uh, you have always to be careful. On the one hand, there are a lot of uh, proof of concepts out there, a lot of uh, pilots, which is not the real thing yet. And then often also something is issued that is not a claim on the central bank. And what I said in the beginning, only if something is a liability of the central bank, then you don't have the counterparty risk. Then it's the the real thing, uh, but if you have uh, um, uh, another, uh, another entity issuing it, like a telecom firm or so, then you still have, again, this counterparty risk. So if central banks are asked, and this survey is from uh, this year, from January, if they are asked, uh, what is the likelihood that you will issue a general purpose CBDC, one that is available to everyone, then you have 10% to say within the next three years, 20% within the next six years. If you ask the same thing about wholesale CBDC, you get a slightly lower number, but you see that, that central banks are seriously working on uh, this issue. Now, Switzerland has a little bit of different uh, perspective on this. So we are not working on something uh, for the normal payment system, not on a retail CBDC. Our point of view is that we look from the infrastructure side uh, at it. And Swiss Infrastructure and Exchange 6 has a quite a long history of uh, innovative disruption. Uh, and a lot of times in Switzerland, we are not the first, but when we do it, then we do it, we do it uh, properly and completely. Like, for instance, the payment system. We were not the first to have a real-time payment system uh, for among commercial banks, we were not the first time, the first ones to have a gross settlement system, but we were the first time to have at the same time a gross and a real-time settlement system. The same with the stock exchange. We were not the first one to go online to have electronic trading, but we were the first ones in the mid-90s to have the full value change uh, electronic from the trade, the, the processing, and the settlement. And this here is not the picture of the after-conference party, of, but this is the picture, actually, the last day of uh, trading at the Swiss Stock Exchange when they moved from the floor to a fully electronic system. I don't know how many people realized that their jobs were at stake here, but they were, <laughs> seemed to be quite happy about it. Now, what's going on now is basically the next stage, that Swiss uh, Exchange 6 is now working on what will be again not the first exchange that has something to do with blockchain, but it will be the first fully regulated, official, end-to-end -end blockchain uh, exchange. So the trading, the settlement, and the custody service for digital assets 
uh, in the future uh, equities bonds will be settled on DLT technology. So that's what SIX is working on. It's called SDX, uh, Swiss Digital Exchange, and their plan is to actually go live end of this year. So we will still see if that's really doable, but they have quite an ambitious uh, program. The question then comes up, of, of course, you have now all these digital assets on the DLT, on the blockchain, but what do you do with the cash lag, with the money side? And these are exactly, again, the issues we talked about uh, in the beginning. And we decided that as part of a proof of concept, also at this stage only, that we explore with them the option that we will provide the Swiss franc token for this uh, blockchain, that they have real central bank money without count counterparty risk on the blockchain. But basically, there are three things that are being done right now. The one is that uh, SDX says we go live, whether you guys are ready or not. So they are working on their own SDX coin. So what they basically do is they, they produce a stable coin. The way they will do it, you have uh, at the Swiss National Bank, at the central bank level, you have the different banks have their accounts. Then we have the Swiss payment system, SIC. The banks have their settlement accounts there. And SDX will also have an account there. And basically, on the blockchain, of the Swiss digital exchange, they will just have uh, their own node and they will tokenize for the uh, member banks uh, the, the, the money and put that on the blockchain. Then basically you have a stable coin, but this is exactly the problem then that I mentioned in the beginning. You have a counterparty risk involved. So if SDX, for instance, would go bankrupt, you have a problem with your money. Now, the clearly better solution, and that's what usually central banks uh, prefer, especially if you have systemically important infrastructure, is that settlement is done with central bank money that doesn't involve counterparty risk. And that's, I think, the exciting project that we are working on. And that would look like this, that we would actually be the node on that blockchain and tokenize the money for the individual banks from their accounts, and then they can uh, pay and uh, settle their uh, payments on the blockchain with a tokenized Swiss franc provided by the Swiss, Swiss Central Bank. And then just to uh, also see whether this is really more efficient, we also do another proof of concept where we say, okay, how would it look like if we just combine the two worlds? We do not provide a native token for the blockchain, not a Swiss franc token, but we just kind of hook up the blockchain with our settlement uh, system. So uh, that, that is actually to see whether we really get uh, more efficiency if they do it, uh, if we do everything on the blockchain. And this is a little bit from the experience that some other central banks had, Bank of Canada, uh, Monetary Authorities of Singapore, they tried to have this middle layer, this, what we call here the SIC, the payments between the banks, uh, to put that on a blockchain. And they actually found out that it's not more efficient than the current system, at least as long as you not find some way to make a, a very clever use of smart contracts and maybe other apps that you build on it. But the problem, of course, or maybe not the problem, the good thing is that the current payment infrastructure uh, in many countries is extremely efficient. Payments among the banks, but not so much payments uh, for households on retail. So we also do uh, this uh, proof of concept just to see whether we really get the efficiency gains that we uh, look forward to. So as I said, the, the plan is that uh, SDX intends to go live uh, end of this year. Uh, we are only working on the proof of concept, so it's not really clear yet whether we will go live at the same time with them or not. That still has to be decided within the board of the central bank. If we do not go live at the same time, they will start with their own uh, stable coin, their private SDX coin. But uh, we will clearly see how that works out. And I think it's a, a relevant uh, experiment also for other central banks. So the way we look at CBDCs is really we look at the in, from the infrastructure side. What kind of infrastructure is being built out there with blockchain? And then always the question comes up, if you trade on these uh, blockchains, how do you pay on these blockchains? And how do you get money on the blockchain? And what type of money do you want to have on the blockchain? Thank you very much.